Conventional wisdom tells us hate has no value. Hate is dangerous. Hate is harmful. And if we are to achieve social justice, we must put a stop to hate speech. Silence it by any means necessary. Louder, ladies, louder! But what if the fight to stop hate speech is more harmful than the speech itself? Listening to Nazis or white supremacists speak isn't my idea of a good time. Swastikas, cross burnings, marching with tiki torches. I'm not a fan of the whole hate flicks and chill lifestyle. So let's just make it illegal. Problem solved, right? Hate mongers have their messages amplified by every attempt to censor them, shut them down, disrupt them. Most people are shocked to learn that in Germany, during the period when the Nazis rose to power, there were very strict anti-hate speech laws. Many leading Nazis actually served time in prison. And guess what? They loved it. It became a propaganda platform for them. They received attention and sympathy that they otherwise never would have. And that's why hate mongers to this day follow that same strategy. You will not replace us. Whether it's a proud white nationalist like Richard Spencer or a proud campus clown like Milo Yiannopoulos, the definition of hate speech may shift, but the pattern is always the same. Shutting people down doesn't silence them. It makes them louder and stronger. I mean, hello, darling. Please, sir. Sir, please. I have an idea how we can solve this. Maybe I'll just come here. I think the platform can certainly make careers because then they become martyrs in a sense. They're able to say, look at what happened to me on this college campus. We have the right to defend ourselves. And so this shutting down Milo Yiannopoulos and doing whatever is necessary to do that is our right to self-defense. What about the shot outside? What shot? Now the victim fights for his life as the anger on Inauguration Day rages on. Milo used provocation to skyrocket himself to fame. And in response to his hurtful words, protesters turned to violence as a coping mechanism. Unfortunately, that's become the new norm for far too many people. Are we sure this is the path we want to go down? Because I'd rather you tell me why I'm wrong than punch me why I'm wrong. Somebody once said that every great truth began as a blasphemy. That includes our country's proudest achievements in social justice, the abolition of slavery, women's suffrage, the civil rights movement. All were extremely unpopular, even hated in their day. Once we give government power to pick and choose which ideas are sufficiently hated to be suppressed, then no idea is safe. We might not know the difference between fake news and real news, but surely we can differentiate between actual hate speech, like Hitler-level hate speech, and speech that gets labeled hate speech just because someone doesn't want to hear it. I mean, they're doing it in Europe. Last year, the head of an LGBT rights organization was convicted of a crime for using the word homophobe because homophobe was considered hate speech under French law. In that same vein, any advocacy of Palestinian rights has been attacked and prosecuted as anti-Semitism. I find the whole idea of hate speech to be incredibly bizarre, as though there's some objective metric of what speech and ideas are hateful and what speech and ideas aren't. In France, for example, French courts have upheld the prosecution of pro-Palestinian activists on the grounds that singling out Israel for boycotting 
is racist and bigoted in violation of the law. So once you start empowering governments to decide what is sufficiently hateful, to the ways in which it's going to be used is inevitably um, going to expand beyond what you think and ultimately will be used against ideas that you like. The U.S. Supreme Court has consistently upheld First Amendment protections for hate speech. After all, one person's hate speech is another person's heartfelt truth or dispassionate analysis. But times are changing, and we're starting to follow the example of Europe. And it happens to be on that exact same issue, pro-Palestinian activism. We see it on the federal and state levels and on college campuses, both public and private. Consider Fordham University. Basically, students wanted to start a pro-Palestinian advocacy group. And this is controversial in some quarters. And Fordham just threw every possible obstacle at these kids. And kids who wanted to run pro-Israeli groups did not face the same obstacles. The Foundation for Individual Rights in Education ranked Fordham as one of the worst colleges when it comes to free speech. It's gotten so bad that some students are even suing the university. So I thought I'd restore balance to the universe and invite members of Students for Justice in Palestine to be in our video. I wanted to hear their first-hand accounts of censorship. They said yes. But then a funny thing happened on the way to the Fordham. Yeah. Why, why did they cancel? Here's, our, here's what happened. After further consideration and review of Lou Perez's recent work and appearances, we've decided to decline your invitation to interview for this project. Unlike Fordham, we wanted to give them a platform to speak, to lay out their grievances with Fordham University. We see the same suppression of speech and lack of humanity in Fordham's administration that we see in WTI videos. Are you getting the irony here? You lost us when WTI gave a platform to speakers who argued in favor of the pseudosciences or quote, race science used for eugenic violence. That never happened. Number one, I don't lift up the voices of bigots. I satirize them. And two, race science? Do these students not know how commas work? What harm would talking to me possibly have done? Well, we were pretty upset to find out Lou Perez is not a eugenicist. There are students who simply don't like what the speaker has to say. And they have found that there are solicitous authorities who react to rhetoric of trauma. And so if you employ that, if you use it, they think they'll get what they want. Christina Summers! Christina Summers has repeatedly, has repeatedly delegitimized, delegitimized the suffering of women! I was at Lewis and Clark College last year, of the law school, where you're supposed to learn to argue and listen to both sides, and a group of students, rather large group, inside and outside the auditorium, would not allow me to speak. We've heard it. It's not like she's a myth. We've heard her speak before. She's she's five minutes. What was interesting is the majority of kids in the audience, they were very angry at the protesters. They didn't necessarily agree with me, but they were interested to hear what I had to say and to perhaps challenge it. I, I just can't think of a worse way of teaching kids how to interact with the world than telling them they're going to be traumatized by her presence on their college campus. Maybe there's a small sample of kids who really have mental health problems. The response to that should be to get kids the help they need, not to encourage them to feel traumatized by opposing views. I went to Oberlin College, and I was shocked. They had a safe room where people could flee if I said something distressing in my talk. Actually, 30 women and a therapy dog fled to a safe space. I triggered a dog. <laughs> You know, at some point we all got kind of addicted to the thrill of the spectacle of seeing people humiliated. They know that it's not violence. What they're saying is we're going to pretend that we have been violently assaulted by these words. Transphobic piece of shit! Transphobic piece of shit! And in actual fact, they are bullying people. So they're actually using force and they're pretending to be the victims of force. Pro tip for protesters, anything over 85 decibels causes permanent hearing loss. And that's like actual trauma. 
If anyone in your movement has an air horn, just kick them out by any means necessary. Protesters at the College of William and Mary in Virginia shut down a free speech event hosted by, of all people, the ACLU. Why'd they do that? Because free speech is now bigotry. There has been a disturbing tendency to lump together everything from white supremacists to my own colleagues in the American Civil Liberties Union. The executive director of the ACLU in Virginia was shouted down at the College of William and Mary, where ironically, she had been invited to make a presentation about students' right to protest. I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, knowing your rights and protesting demonstrations. Now, the reason that she was disrupted was because of the ACLU's staunch defense, even for the thought that we hate, even the right to advocate anti-civil liberties ideas. If you're shouting down the American Civil Liberties Union, which exists to defend your right to protest, we have a problem. I don't care how creative your chants are. If you're not engaging with those you disagree with and you're only interested in surrounding yourself with the people who affirm what you think, you know, it gets to a point where your arguments are not going to be as strong or as sharp or as persuasive as they might be because you're no longer testing yourself. In the end, what it's really going to do is make sure that there is no internal debate and as a result, they're going to become so weakened intellectually because people will have no idea why they even hold those positions. They've never had to argue for them. If what we want to do is go out in the world and achieve positive change, whether it's changing minds, whether it's touching hearts, whether it's affecting policy, you cannot succeed in doing that if you're only going to talk to people who are going to affirm your beliefs. We already know that hate turns people into monsters, but what's becoming clear is that there's no way to silence the monsters without becoming one of them. So, what's the answer? If we just tune out opposing viewpoints, we lose an opportunity to fight for a better future, to come together and fight for things that we have in common. I feel like that people need to at least converse in some kind of dialogue for us to bridge Bridge of divides that's been happening in the last few years. Free speech is really complicated. You need to look at it in a reasonable way and look at it in context. And if you want to rob someone of the ability to do that, you should have a good reason for it and, and think about if you're doing more harm than good. This generation now is facing a very special challenge. I believe they will rise up and defend their freedoms as others have done, but I think it's time to organize and take back your liberties. What is at stake is a principle. That principle is essential for you. To be fair, most of the night was peaceful. We even saw a group hug between people on the right and left. The task we have is trying to find those things that we have in common. That I don't expect people to go out and have one tough conversation and then they're experts. That this is incremental, it's slow, and that change is a process. If we are to achieve real social justice, we may actually need hate speech. And if you find this video hateful, well, I invite you to confront me about it in a nice way. But please, no air horns. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like it, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. Make sure you click the little bell to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. And if you really like the video, you can even support We The Internet TV on Patreon. Check out the link in the description below.